why is the ministry more than just a profession? Numbers 3. Let's put the text in context coming up next. It's really interesting because in order to understand the context of Numbers chapter 3, we have to understand from which these laws are coming. They're coming from the very center of the camp. Remember that at the center of the camp was the tent tabernacle. This was the place where God would give direction to Israel. And they were instructed specifically to put it at the center of the camp. It was to be the center of their lives. The message is intriguing. It's intriguing because we learn the descriptions, the roles of the priests, the roles of the Levites, because you see the priest and the Levites were different roles. And it's very interesting, there is a structure here. And that structure is not determined by popularity contests or not determined by popular vote or electorates, no. This is determined by God himself. This is the biggest difference between our culture today and God's culture. You say, Rod, does God have a culture? Well, in fact, he does. It's driven by his word. And here Moses, talking about the Levites, helps us understand what it is. For example, God says here that he accepts the Levites and the priests as the sacrifice for the people. In other words, the priests and the Levites are given to God in place of the firstborn of the people. Now, that's interesting because they represent us before God. Our Bible IQ question today is this, who, by God's power, blinded bar Jesus for a season? Was it Peter, Paul, or James? Now, later on, we'll give you the answer to this kind of fascinating Bible IQ question if you'll just stay tuned with us. There are several significant objects which emerge in the first chapters of Genesis that remain the mainstay of communication throughout the rest of the Bible. One of these is how the original Hebrew scribes processed numbers, letters, and their meaning. In the Hebrew alphabet, there are 22 letters. Each letter also represents a number. Numbers and letters together were significant ways of communication for the ancient Hebrew scribes. The fact that man was created on the sixth day indicates that the number six represents man. The fact that God rested on the seventh day indicates that the number seven represents God. Also significant is the fact that God marked Cain with a sign. This sign meant an idea and gave birth to the profession of scribes. This month I'm asking you to do something very, very special. I want you to be involved with us in reaching people. If you know someone who's gone through a divorce or a separation or a betrayal, or if you know someone who is addicted to some type of drugs or alcohol, we prepared two wonderful books for them. I want you to order these books and hand them out to them. One of the books is called, very simply, Why God Hates Divorce But Not the Divorce. The other is The D Dynamic Dozen. Now remember, when you do write to us, we are viewer supported, and we do need your continued help to keep the program on the air. So take a moment, write for these two books, and say, yes, I want to be a witness this month. And you can do that by handing out this book to someone that you love and care for. Remember your best gift. Here is our address. It's Life Lessons, Box 2000, Goodyear, Arizona, 85338. Write today. Entertainer Michael Jackson finds it hard to appreciate any other singer except himself. He says of Paul McCartney, quote, OK, writer, not much of an entertainer. I do better at the box office, end of quote. He puts down Frank Sinatra this way, quote, I don't know what people see in the guy, he's a legend, but he isn't much of a singer, end of quote. Jackson criticizes Mick Jagger. He says this, quote, he sings flat. How did he ever get to be a star? I just don't get it. He doesn't sell as many records as I do, end of quote. And Jackson also says of Madonna, quote, she isn't that good, let's face it. She can't sing. She just is an okay dancer. What does she do best? 
she knows how to market herself, end of quote. Well, you know, tragically, many ministers have the same attitude as Jackson. They see little value in the work of anyone except their ministry. Now, this attitude is appalling and, by the way, against God's word. Leviticus teaches ministers are a part of a great team, the body of Christ. On this Friday, we are continuing the study of Numbers. In fact, we are at Numbers chapter 3 and chapter 4. Now, I admit these are difficult chapters to read. We can get so bogged down in all of the confusion and confusing words that we kind of miss sometimes what God's saying to us. Well, I hope today's program will help clarify a little of that. Let's, in a moment, look into Scripture. But before we do, let me remind you that in chapter 3, the name of Aaron's sons are mentioned as the numbering of Israel continues, and the substitution of the Levites for firstborn of Israelites, that's in the last part of the chapter. Chapter 4, the service of the Kohathites and the Maronites and the Gashanites and the numbering of the Levites. Now remember, those were three divisions of the tribe of Levi, and each of them had different assignments in the worship experience of the nation. So basically, that's what we're talking about today, and it does sound a little tedious, doesn't it? Well, I hope that it will uh, be less tedious as we move into this very important part of God's Word. Here, before we get into the life lessons and the PowerPoints, is Scripture. This is God's Word. This is the account of the family of Aaron and Moses at the time the Lord talked with Moses on Mount Sinai. The names of the sons of Aaron were Nadab, the firstborn, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. Those were the names of Aaron's sons, the anointed priests, who were ordained to serve as priests. Nadab and Abihu, however, fell dead before the Lord when they made an offering with unauthorized fire before him in the desert of Sinai. They had no sons, so only Eleazar and Ithamar served as priests during the lifetime of their father Aaron. The Lord said to Moses, Bring the tribe of Levi and present them to Aaron the priest to assist him. They are to perform duties for him and for the whole community at the tent of meeting by doing the work of the tabernacle. They are to take care of all the furnishings of the tent of meeting, fulfilling the obligations of the Israelites by doing the work of the tabernacle. Give the Levites to Aaron and his sons. They are the Israelites who are to be given wholly to him. Appoint Aaron and his sons to serve as priests. Anyone else who approaches the sanctuary must be put to death. The Lord also said to Moses, I have taken the Levites from among the Israelites in place of the first male offspring of every Israelite woman. The Levites are mine, for all the firstborn are mine. When I struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, I set apart for myself every firstborn in Israel, whether man or animal. They are to be mine. I am the Lord. Numbers 3, verses 1 through 13. Keep in mind, when Samuel was born, he was the firstborn. And, of course, he was given back to God. He was the first fruits. So Israel had a, a long history of offering the first of the flock, the cattle, whatever, to the Lord. God said, since Egypt's bondage delivered, uh, delivered you from Egypt's bondage, I have asked for the first fruits of of your trees, of your field, of your cattle, and of your sons. Which really meant that every son of the Israelites, the firstborn, was to be in ministry. However, we see in this segment that God says, now that probably is not too practical, so I'm going to set aside a tribe. And the tribe is the tribe of Levi, and they are going to be substitutes. Those priests are going to be taking the place of the firstborn sons, so they are really what is called the first fruits of Israel. Very wonderful uh, program that God outlined. Well, let's get into our PowerPoints or life lessons today. Here is the first. 
Ministry is a calling, not a profession. Aaron and his family had been called and anointed for ministry by God. Now, beloved, we really can't simply say, well, I think I'm going to be a, a preacher, like, you, like, a, like you'd say that I'm going to be a fireman. You can't do that. Ministers of God must be called by God. And remember, God ordains us from our mother's womb, Jeremiah chapter 1, 5, and puts within our heart the abilities and talents that we can become all he wants us to be. That's programmed in us even before we're born. And then, of course, he makes his calling known to us. And if we respond positively back to that calling, then we are thrust or ordained into ministry. But ministry, beloved, is a calling. Whether it is a priest or a pastor or an evangelist or a teacher, it is a calling. And we need to keep that in mind. Our next life lesson or PowerPoint is this. Ministers must take God's word seriously. Nadab and Abihu lost their lives because they modified God's word. Now, there are those who say they appeared before God intoxicated, drunk, and they desecrated the altar. That may have been true. That's speculation, and it's speculation because right after that, the next verse, after talking about their demise, deals with how that ministers are not to go into ministry inebriated. So scholars have said that's apparently what these two boys did. We do know that they offered unholy fire to God. That is, they didn't do things as God wanted. Ministers have to be careful to say what God wants them to say, and people want to hear, thus saith the Lord, not thus saith man. So we have got to understand that ministers are called of God to speak the words of God. Now, our next life lesson is this. Ministry is a cooperative effort. The whole tribe of Levites was to do ministry. We're not to be lone rangers. Notice he calls some to lead the music of the tribes of Levite. Some who would take care of the house or the tabernacle. Later, it would be the temple. Some who were to take care of other aspects of worship. The Levites were divided into three different clans for that purpose. And that speaks to us that we as ministers must be cooperative one with the other, denominations cooperative one with the other. God called us not to be lone rangers, but to work with others. Our next life lesson is this. Ministers must maintain holiness. The Levites were set up to guard God's holiness and to live purely before him. Notice they were to be careful how they handled the holy things, how they approached the altar, because God was holy or set apart from all other gods. He was different. He was to be revered. So ministers were to protect the holiness of God in the minds of the people, and they were to live separate, that is, live differently than the rest of the world, so by their example, people could see how God wanted all of us to live. A very important concept. Here's our next PowerPoint. Ministers are never their own. God has claim on their lives and resources. God said, they are mine. I am the Lord. Now notice, the Levites were not given any property because God was their inheritance. And God wanted to make sure that they weren't businessmen. They weren't entrepreneurs, but they were called to do what God asked them to do. In Timothy, it talks about how that good soldiers don't get involved with the things of this world. And that's speaking directly to young preachers, that we are to be called by God for a specific task and not get ourselves bogged down with all these other things like making money or building businesses or building great retirement funds. We are to do what God asks us to do. Here is our word walk today. God's work would be far more effective, beloved, if we affirmed other ministers and ministries rather than put them down. God has called many to do his work. Our corner of the vineyard is important but not exclusive. Now, I, I thank God that he has called us to this task, but we're not the only ministers he's called. 
There are many other ministers. Some of you have seen just before this program, some just after this program. Some you see in churches. God has called many people to this great vineyard harvesting for the Lord. And rather than lifting up our eyes and looking on the harvesters, we need to look on the harvest. We need to affirm each other, beloved, rather than criticize each other and move forth to do what God has asked us to do, remembering that just as there were three tribes of the Levites doing various works of God, so there are many ministries that God has raised up in this day to do all kinds of things to bring God glory. Occasionally, there are great discoveries which excite the minds of archaeologists as they uncover exact descriptions of what the biblical texts report. One such discovery was in the last century of excavation of the walls at Jerusalem. In Nehemiah chapter 3, there is a description of specific places repaired that are now visible. A man named Shallon repaired a fountain gate and wall that goes down as the stairs from the city of David. Verse 25 of Nehemiah tells of a tower which projects from the king's upper house by the court of the prison that was repaired. It can be seen today. And verse 26 says, repairs were made in the front sections of the water gate and the tower that projects from there. Today, one can walk up and touch those very walls. I want to give you a very special way that you can help someone you love. That is by giving them one of these little books and sharing a prayer with them. Do that this month. If you know someone who's going through a divorce, separation, or betrayal, you know someone perhaps who is addicted to alcohol, drugs, or whatever, we have prepared two wonderful books. One is called, very simply, Why God Hates Divorce But Not the Divorce. The other is The Dynamic Dozen. We'll put these in your hands if you'll write to us right away. Now, this is a wonderful opportunity for you to witness and share God's love with the people that you love, these two wonderful little books. Remember, we are viewer-supported. We do need your best gift this month to keep the ministry strong and on the air. Write to us today with your very best gift. Ask for these two books. The address is Life Lessons, Box 2000, Goodyear, Arizona, 85338. Take a moment and write today. Linda comments some constructive criticism on the way we put the Life Lessons program together. Well, you can stop by our website and, like Linda, send an email to us. It's northernquest.com. We have a guest book there. Hope to see you there. Stop by. By the time of Christ, the 39 books we know as the Old Testament were accepted as the canon of Scripture, or the inspired Word of God, in the Hebrew Bible. Christ substantiated many Old Testament writings by directly quoting them in his teaching. The 27 books of the New Testament came together based on the test of apostleship. Documents were accepted if they were written by an apostle or someone close to and recognized by an apostle, such as Mark or Luke. There were false documents about Christ and false apostles being circulated, so all the religious writings came under strict scrutiny and vigorous tests of authenticity to be accepted. By A.D. 200, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were the only accepted Gospels. Paul's letters were considered just as important at this time also. Church leaders were greatly concerned that only the inspired Word of God be taught, and over a period of time, it became apparent which documents should be accepted. At the Council of Hippo in A.D. 393, and at the Council of Carthage in A.D. 397, the 27 books that make up our New Testament were officially accepted as the canon of Scripture. There is a collection of other writings called the Apocrypha, that was written between 200 B.C. and 100 A.D. Some consider these important religious and historical documents and valuable for study, but they did not become a part of the canon of Scripture for several reasons, including the fact they did not appear in any Hebrew canon and none of their content is quoted in the New Testament. Throughout the whole process of putting together the Bible, we can see God's hand at work. God chose to use men to record His Word, but that word was determined by God and God alone. The Bible can be trusted to be the inspired word of God and will prove itself time and time again 
when you pattern your life after its teachings. Well, Rod, we're going to ease up a little bit on the uh, Bible IQ questions today. Is that all right with you, you? You always scare me when you say ease up because I'm not sure if that's good or bad. Who, by God's power, blinded bar Jesus for a season? Was it Peter, Paul, or James? I believe, Dad, it was uh, Paul, wasn't it? That's right, Acts chapter 13, verses 4 through 12. See, I told you I was going to ease up a little bit. Now, you're jumping into the New Testament, I noticed, uh, now that we're studying the Old Testament. Well, don't get too relaxed, because we're going to turn up the heat again. Oh, let me tell you something. When it comes to the Bible IQ question, I don't see how I can become too relaxed these days. <laughs> okay, Rod. Uh, we uh, feature on video posts many wonderful ministries, and uh, there is a ministry that uh, is touching youth. Of course, youth is very close to your heart, Rod, so why don't you introduce this one? Yes, of course. Uh, I mean, this is a ministry in Houston, Texas. Let's take a look at it. We'll back, be back to comment after this. By receiving Christ into their lives, young people in Houston are not only finding the strength to weather the storms of their current living situations, but they're beginning to forge a solid moral and spiritual foundation, which, for the first time, offers an optimistic outlook on their future. There are many programs out there today that address the problems that we at Hope for Youth are attempting to address. We believe that addressing the spiritual nature of these children is first and foremost uh, the thing that is to be done. I definitely have a lot more self-esteem. Um, I'm definitely able to go out and, and be a part of a group and take, take charge and become, I, I definitely become more of a leader. With Hope for Youth, I, I basically have that chance to, you know, kind of like a second chance almost to really get my life back on, on track. I have a home, I have family, I have friends. Um, I've, I've got a sense of well-being. I've got strength that God has given me. Tremendous strength. Originating from and working alongside the Star of Hope Mission, Houston's largest homeless shelter, Hope for Youth was born in 1991 of one individual's desire to provide the mission's children with ongoing Christian ministry beyond their stay at the shelter. My name is Wendy Doolin, and I'm director of a youth ministry that's called Hope for Youth. And we work with teenagers here. As I was Hope thinking about starting Hope for Youth and thinking about the vision and the mission of Hope for Youth, I really wanted to work with the kids in all aspects of their life, really to be able to, for them to become complete people, complete in Christ. And as I was praying about that, God brought to my mind the verse Colossians 1.28, which is when Paul is talking that he is laboring to present every man complete in Christ. And I substitute youth for man, so I read it as every youth complete in Christ. That is absolutely remarkable. One of the things that uh, a lot of people forget about these days is that there's a lot of hard issues. I mean, there's a lot of tough questions that this generation has got to answer or has to deal with that many previous generations, uh, Dad, have not had to deal with. And you know what's interesting about that is that the Bible provides answers to those questions if we simply tap into it. And that's what this one youth group, uh, Star of Hope, I believe it is, is doing. Well, the, uh, the ministry there in Houston, this youth ministry, is remarkable. I, I saw a full-blown video production of that work and how God is using those young people, and it is really remarkable. We want you to let us know about any group that you feel is doing something remarkable for God. Why don't you let us know so we can feature it on video post. I do hope that today's program has been of some help to you as we have talked about the importance of ministry and also, beloved, the importance of cooperating with other ministers and ministries God has raised up. That's very important for us to learn. Let me leave you with an insight and also a scripture that I would suggest that you memorize. Here is the insight. Success is knowing the difference between cornering people and getting them in your corner. A good word. Now, may I suggest you commit this scripture verse to memory. Do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? You'll find that in Amos chapter 3, verse 3. And beloved, when we find people of like precious faith, that simply means people who love Jesus Christ passionately, who believe that God sent his only begotten son into the world to redeem the world through the death on Calvary, that 
is the basis of friendship and of fellowship. Let us affirm all of those who preach the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And may I suggest that you start doing that now, today that you would seek out someone, perhaps not of your denomination, not of your particular brand of, quote, religion, but someone who loves Jesus passionately and affirm them, and not only affirm them, but affirm their work, appreciate what they're doing and how God has called them to their unique tasks.